menace of sobriety. Just a menace. Just, just a menace. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming live from the Big Belly Comedy Club. It is Menace to Sobriety with your host, Mr. Daniel O'Reilly. Boom, boom, boom. Hello and welcome to another episode of Menace to Sobriety. I am your host with the most and I don't mean the boast. It's Dan O'Reilly, a.k.a. Dapper Laughs. And uh, yeah, man, welcome to the podcast. Listen, the podcast has been on some wild journey. We've had lots of different people in. It's been different formats, all of that jazz. Um, and who knows where it's going to go. But right now, I'm doing what I'm enjoying with the podcast. And what I am enjoying is meeting people, connecting, talking, and, um, yeah, just sharing, right? And just, like, sort of finding out what people have been through, um, the different stories, what they've, what they've overcome, what we can take. Everybody that I speak to in this studio has something that I get from from the conversation some new nugget of information some new little bit of inspiration um and yes yeah, like my therapy these are like my meetings these keep me keep me sober and uh keep me happy and I love to share that uh with you guys on this platform before I introduce the guest big shout out to John the producer welcome hello thank you how you doing I'm, I'm good it's great to see you I haven't fixed the camera okay um I don't know how to do it but here I am and I'm ready to learn I'm ready to laugh and I'm ready to yeah Learn and laugh. Yeah, but there's something going on with your hearing, isn't it? You said you've got a hearing problem today. Yeah, I've played in rock bands for like 10 years, and all I can just hear is just right. go up so, and shout. So, my podcast producer's deaf. Yes, that's right. Okay, that's great. <laughs> okay, welcome. The system works. Welcome to show business, baby. Oh, oh that's all right. The, oh, the, sneak peek of the guest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage. Today's guest, Terry Devine. How are you doing, Terry? Pleased to meet you, Dan. Thanks for having us on. That's all right. Welcome. Yep. yep. How are you feeling? Yeah, not too bad. Been yeah. up early. It's been a long journey to yeah. get here. Where you come from? A Western Supermare today. How, how long was the journey down? It's about two and a half hours, three hours to get down here. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And uh, we met at my uh, Minister Sobriety live gig. Yes, that's right. You had Elliot Ward on and yeah. Clark was with you. Yeah. John was there as well. John was there. Yeah, yep. fantastic evening that was. And um, yeah, we got chatting. Also, me and you actually, I, I remember, I can remember now from your name. It's weird because you never click on the profile. Well, I don't click on the profile and search through people's lives when I'm in my DMs. The DMs come up and I try and inter engage or interact with as many people as I can. Uh, but me and you have been chatting on and off for a little while. Yeah, yeah. Through the DMs. So I've been following you for ages and it's really weird because on my Instagram, I mm. don't follow any of my friends at all. Right. <clears throat> So I just follow people that inspire me. So I'm following like Tony Robbins, Eric mm. Thomas, all these type type of people. And then tucked in there, I had this like comedian that yeah. laughs, right? But I used to watch your co content the most out of everyone's. And then you made this massive transition mm. into like sobriety, advocate for addiction and everything. And it just kind of fell into place. So I started messaging and wow. reaching out because I like what you're doing. Yeah, thank you, you, man. Are. Thank you. Yes, yeah, weird, isn't it? Weird from comedy to to uh, well-being, mental health and stuff like that. But I love it, man. I love it. And I love chatting to people and getting feedback. But um, yeah, and then you, you mentioned about coming on. Um, so I asked you to ping your ping your like sort of bio and details yeah. over to Jade, my illustrious personal assistant, and she was like, "Yeah, we've got to get him on. Great story." Um, other people's sort of <laughs> it's, it's tricky, isn't it? Because it's like other people's uh, troubles in life are like are like are, are are like great for this podcast because you know, like I was saying to you outside, um, and what and, and I'm a firm believer, mate Terry. I'm a firm believer that. The, the best thing that can come from what we go through is the ability to help other people, right? Exactly, and, yeah. And also, it gives us gives us character. So, right, without further ado, let's get into it. Tell me about your story. Tell me who you are and tell me why you're on the Menace of Sobriety podcast. So, my name's Terry Devine. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of put myself forward for this because I like to, to share my message of what I've been through. Mm. Because I remember when I was in that dark place, I didn't think, I didn't know about the messages out there. Mm. I didn't know about the help out there. And it's when I started hearing these messages and people telling their stories that it inspired a bit of hope into me. Mm. So I just like kind of giving my story, sharing it in the hope that someone else will hear something, latch on to that, or maybe latch on to something you say today or what John says mm. and take that nugget away. Yeah. And they can use that somewhere to influence their life in some way to make it progressively better. Yeah. I'm with you on that, mate. Yeah. So where did it all start for you, mate? Oh. Well, if if you 
if we go back and have a look at it on mm. paper, my childhood looked all right. Yeah, it weren't so bad, you know. My parents were there. It was quite a, a good upbringing. It was decent. I was loved. I was mm. supported. I was in kind of like a safe, protected environment. Yeah. And then somewhere along the line, something went wrong. You know, mm. I, I could go right back into childhood and look at certain things that have happened, etc. Yeah. But at some stage, you know, there was a decision made by me to kind of veer off the the, the right path onto the wrong path. Mm. You know what I mean? And is it nature? Is it nurture? Who knows? Yeah. But you know, if you, you know, one of the things is if we go right back uh, to when I first started primary school. I mean, how old's your youngest now? My youngest is four. She's a right rascal. She's yeah. four years old, yeah. So, so four. four years old. So I was five when I went to primary, primary school. Primary school, yeah. And uh, so I've left the protection of my parents, loving, safe environment. And I get put in this class with this teacher, and she's like a bit of a prehistoric teacher. Yeah. Like a wartime teacher. And mm. from the moment we entered as these little infants, little children... She just was really kind of strict and the whole atmosphere in the classroom was just shouting. I hate her already. Scream, yeah. Yeah, I really hate her. Yeah. yeah. yeah good. So do I. Yeah. M- Miss Bonner, let's have her name out there. Yeah. She's gone now. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing to do, mate. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I went back to that primary school <laughs> five years later when I was 10 and Bunk slapped her. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, um, yeah. Yeah, but it was like rolling like a tyrant and I just remember... Well, I, I, I didn't remember. It was my mum that triggered something. She said, oh, you, when you was in Miss Bonner's class, you used to have a twitch. And I remember, and it kind of triggered some memories, and I used to have a twitch, and I used to wet myself all Oh, it makes me so sad that yeah. I was listening so to that. So that's why I yeah. asked you how old Rue was. Yeah, because, because yeah, when I see when I see Rue, she's she's such a tiny little baby still. Yeah. They're still tiny little babies. Yeah. And um, they need to be, like, wrapped in cotton. I mean, taught, but wrapped in cotton wool and love. And, you know, when she walks in, they grab her and they yeah. cuddle her and everyone's holding hands and cuddling, and she, come, she comes bouncing out of class. Yeah, and they yeah. like it. Yeah, my daughter does. But in that class, like... She, you know, she used to take me out the front of the class and I'd have my shorts on where I'd wet myself and she just used to slap me and yes. smack me. And so I think from that moment, I had shame slapped into me yeah. as a little boy. And that has stayed with me through my whole life. Yeah. You and know? just, just, just quickly, sorry to interrupt you, but they, they say shame has got such a massive part in addiction, haven't they? Yeah. There's uh, some kind of scale, I forget what it's called. And shame is like the lowest vibrational energy. It's right at the bottom. And if you're stuck in shame, yeah, you attract all this kind of negativity and you're very stuck in what you do. Mm. And after time, it's not our fault. Yeah. You know, we oh, yeah, please put me in shame. I'd love to live in shame. We've been forced there no. from some environmental factor. Mm. And we find ourselves there and it's really hard to kind of claw your way out of that. Yeah. Well, at least through my experience, it is. Yeah, well, it would take therapy yeah yeah well it's taken plenty of therapy plenty of mm. treatment centers the lot but i mean listen that's abuse that's that that's that's uh, that's abuse right that's uh, even getting smacked i mean like it's times have changed now you know we can't teachers can't hit our we can't we we can't the teachers can't hit our our babies now yep um but that was the old way unfortunately yeah. and and carry on carry on yeah yeah so got that kind of instilled in me mm. and then i've just cracked on and tried to navigate and work my way through uh through life yeah. as, a, as a as a child and i, I guess i masked it up because i was quite active as a child and uh you know to played a lot of sport and stuff like that so everything was good but there was this period in my life when i got to about 13 you know you're kind of on the brink of puberty yeah uh, where i come from we have different schooling systems we used to have primary school a middle school and then our last school right so we was all moving up to this last school, it's called the Comp, right? And uh, so all the schools on the island kind of conjoined to this one school. Mm. And I just remember when I went up there, I just felt so out of place. Mm. Something had shifted and changed in me. And uh, I felt uncomfortable in my own skin. Yeah. Should I identify with that? 100%, yeah, yeah, mate, yeah. That horrible yeah. feeling. And where I used to be quite popular, quite outgoing, quite comfortable, it all changed. Mm. And uh, I just couldn't work it out and what was going on with me. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And I didn't know how to manage it or how to deal with it. 
Yeah. So as a little child like that, you're just thinking, what, what is this? What am I supposed to do? And it's around that period where we started playing football. We started having the odd drink here and there. Mm. But I noticed that if I, when I drank, it you had, felt good. It yeah. all stopped. And it made sense. And I, I felt comfortable again in mm. my own skin. Mm. And the confidence came back. Yeah. Yeah. And I was there and I could think in my head and I could be present. And I thought, oh, okay. So this is alcohol. And I need to take this. I need to like consume this mm. to make myself feel okay. Yeah. You know, but back then it was just like a, a weekend thing when we played football. It's so interesting because uh, that 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 story is probably um, that pro that story is probably rep replicated millions of times across the across the world. You know, yeah. you know, young young child in school doesn't really fit in, doesn't know what to say, doesn't know how to act, doesn't know how to make friends or who is friends, or doesn't really. Uh, and then suddenly you give them drink and put them in an, in an environment where everyone's drinking and they feel like they're fitting in, yeah. and they feel like they can kind of say and do what they want. Um, and I can see how how as kids, you know, we don't even know it, but we start looking forward to it. And then, cause that my whole childhood was, was getting pissed every weekend, yeah. every fucking weekend, getting hammered, getting annihilated, whoever was getting drunk the most. You look forward to it and as you grow up, it gets more and more and more. But what you don't realize what you're doing is you're, you're creating like an attachment to that escapism. Yeah. So it became the new crutch, yeah. you know, where it was football, yeah. playing football. Now it was drinking on the way to football. And then it was drinking, oh, I've got to play a bit of football. Mm. And then it was drinking, and then drinking led to the drinking culture and yeah. getting out there. And it just became part of me, me life. But my, my journey is slightly different to yours. Mm. You know, the way you used was very much in the sesh, you yeah. know, getting stuck in weekends became big. Mine was short-lived in that area. And then I ended up going down a different route, mm. you know, experimenting with drugs, as they say until I found something that kind of sat well with me. Yeah. And then that was my my route to oblivion. What was that? Well, for me, it was uh, heroin. Wow. And uh, it was, I was trying to work it out. Like, it was at a very, very young age. I was probably about 17 or 18. That's scary, man. That's yeah. so scary. Can you talk me through your first experience with it? How it, can you remember how it came about? Well, I mean, where, where were you living then? What was this island? So I live on, well, I was born on the Isle of Sheppey. So it's in Kent. Right. The other side where South End is, the other side of the water. Yeah, because I, I, um, I lived over in Guernsey for a little while with my mm. father. And the island mentality is so different. It's like, it, it's like, there, it's like amplified. Do you know what I mean? Like the drinking, the drug use, everything. It's like everyone's sort of squeezed into a smaller area. And I, f I feel like it's worse. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. It was exactly that. They call mm. us swampies. Right. And we're there. We've got that island mentality. Yeah, and we're just, uh, you know, I'm there, stuck in that kind of area. And I don't know what it was. Maybe this is the addict in me. Mm. But it was always, what's next? Okay, yeah. so I've drunk the alcohol, tried the acid, smoking the weed, wow. done the speed. You know, I had a bit of Charlie. Mm. What's next? And I, this is the insane mentality, always in the back of my head. I thought, when will I get to try heroin? Really? So it was quite a, like a, a poetic love affair with something I hadn't had. Wow. And I don't know why. You know, I used to have posters on me wall with Jim Morrison and Kirk Cobain, all these people that have died from... Heroin. Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> fucking insane. Right into it. You know, yeah, I love them people because they died from drug addiction or something like that, from overdoses. Wow. But I remember the first time I took it, I was with... Uh, a group of us, and I think it was like New Year's Eve and we'd finished up and one of our mates had stopped by and he got some. And back then, how he smoked, it was like chasing the dragon. Right. So it was on foil and he'd done it but, and he said, anyone want a line of this? So I, I had a go and that was it. Nothing really happened, probably too drunk to take it in, probably didn't do it correctly. Mm. So I never thought anything of it. But then the next time I'd done it, when I wasn't drunk and I was away from that environment and when I took it the next time, it just done that thing. It's like waiting for that that warm hug from your parents that you've always longed for. Mm. And it just soothed everything. The head just went quiet. All pain, all problems just dissipated. I just thought, yeah, there it is. Wow. 
there's that thing that gives me the thing that I'm after. <sighs> man. Yeah. That's scary. Yeah. It's very short lived though. Oh, right. Yeah. Because uh, I went from that, I became an intravenous drug user straight away. What do you mean? What, as soon as you used heroin, you went, I want to just sit home doing that? Yeah, I was, it was a very short period from smoking it to becoming someone oh. that used with needles. Right, okay. Yep, and then that was it. And I've done that for the next 20 years of my life. You know what I mean? But <sighs> from that period of starting to use intravenously, intravenously, within a matter of a year or so, I knew that it wasn't for me and I didn't want to do it. And you couldn't get off it for 19 years? Yeah, still. And I, I tried everything in that period of time to stop doing it. Can I just ask... How, <sighs> sorry, it's a lot to take in. Um, it's... Oh man. And this is... It's kind of... This reminds me of when I, when I have been at the meetings before. Sometimes I feel a little bit, you know, we can... F addiction's got so many different faces. Like, you know... And there's so many different levels to addiction, and it never ceases to f terrify me, man. But when you were, so you got, I mean, obviously it's not that much of a jump, is it, to, from from uh, chasing the dragon to injecting it? But can you can you remember why, or you were like, well, I like kind of like the feeling I'm getting from this. Is it better injecting it, and that's how you got to that bit? So, so it, for me, it was. It's it's more intense. It's instant. Right. Yeah, so it's there straight away. You know, it's the difference between sniffing cocaine and smoking crack. It's instant. Mm. But there was this thing that it was the notoriety that went with it. See, that's what I was yeah. going to I was going to ask you about yeah. because to to me, when I look back on my cocaine use, I the 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 actual the actual action of sniffing a lime was so much such a big part of it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If that cocaine was in a pill and they was like, right, take the pill, I'd be like, oh, that's nowhere near as fun. And it's so weird, isn't it? Yeah, it becomes a ritual. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I guess that was uh, part of it. And because I wasn't succeeding as a person on this planet mm. as a teenager, that living outside of society, I suppose I've got recognition. You know, if I was drinking, our Terry will do that. Mm. Terry does that. Well, he'll, he'll get nicked doing this, and I became. I, I guess I, I stood out, so I got mm. recognised. So I was getting attention that I was probably seeking from somewhere where mm. I wasn't getting it. Yeah. So if you're going to be a drug user, be the best one. Yeah, I just <laughs> didn't, didn't happen though. <laughs> <laughs> I was a terrible drug user. So what? Talk to me about. Tell me what did that do to your life? What happened to you in then twenty years? absolutely destroyed everything I had and I had nothing to start with it took everything away destroyed every single relationship and it placed me in a place of existence mm. where for the majority of those years I just felt pain mm. I had suicidal ideation um, I was awkward in myself I was locked away, I was mm. isolated, separated, lonely, you know, and I would try, I'd come out and try and work and lose a job. I'd try and get in a relationship and lose the woman. Mm. I'd try and make things right with my parents and screw up again. Mm. It was just like this, you could see like this landscape of problems just along the, the timeline of my life. Yeah every one thing after another nothing was ever successful dad man I, I, sorry because I, I know not i don't know a lot about um heroin and everything like that. how often did you need to use or did you use daily yeah so when, when it comes to heroin it's like you wake up ill right so you've got to do something to get out there to take away that ill feeling mm -hmm. so when you're withdrawing so it's, if i say it I would wake up and the instant my eyes opened, I'm going, where can I get money from? Right, who's right, who's on? Yeah, who's gyro day is it? Who gets a script today? Right, I can't go to the co, I can't steal anything from there because the security guards are on me. Mm. So I'll have to go to that shop, I'll have to do this, I need a tenner. 
begging, whatever. It was just, I need to get money and I've got to do whatever I can do to get that money. Just get £10 in me so I can get what I need, get that into my system as quick as I can, and then I'd feel all right. So I had to do all that to feel normal, like normal people do when they just wake up and live their life. Once I felt normal, it's like, now I need to go out and earn some money so I can use. Mm. So it just never stopped. Daily vices. So hard. I did have moments where it stopped. Like, I... My brother said to me one time, he said, look, here's a job in France. Go take it. Go over and sort yourself out. So I went over to France and I stopped using. Mm. So I went through all the withdrawals. While I was over there, went through the rattle, clucked, felt ill, and then come out the other end of it. How long How long does that take, that process? It is... It's an ongoing thing. It, it feels... like tw If you look at the clock and the clock moves an hour, it feels like it's moved four hours. It just goes so slow time. You're looking at, for me, three to four weeks. Fucking hell. Of just feeling like you don't sleep, or I've not slept for 11 days, for 16 days at a time. Fuck. You get 20 minutes here and there. You know, you get 20 minutes, you kind of wake up and think, oh, here we go again. It just goes on and on and on. And then there's one stage in that withdrawal process where you just wake up one day and it just feels slightly better. And you're like, I've got something here. And you just think, oh, yes, I'm at the end of it. I'm coming through it. And the problem is, at least for me, I recover physically really quick. Mm. So I think, oh, yeah, I feel Bouncing good back. again. Yeah, oh, that's better, brilliant. I can talk, walk, and do all that. And then I really quickly forget how it was a week prior to that. Mm. You know what I mean? And then, uh, and then slowly over time I'm off but what happened in France mm. so I'm over there I go through that process I turn up so it's the middle of summer in like Saint-Tropez or something and I'm walking around with a coat on rubbing my nose all the time so, oh I've got the flu got the flu and everyone's saying what's wrong with him and as soon as I, that day come when I start to feel better I just go full out on the drink right mm. and I just drink non-stop for the rest of the summer and because I'm disguised as a holiday rep. Mm. I'll get away with it because everyone's drinking. Mm. I'm drinking to the early hours of the morning. I'm waking up every morning. I'm being sick. I can't eat. I'm doing all these things which make me cringe. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm losing jobs. Fuck. Having to change companies, doing all this stuff still going on. But I'm phoning home and going, I've sorted my life out. Yeah. I've done it. I've stopped using mum, dad. It's changed. I'm going to be different. It's all going to be different this time. I just drink solidly for six months. So I substituted one substance for mm. another because I still hadn't dealt with the internal yeah. condition. Yeah. Yeah. I can relate. I can relate. John, if you want to jump in at any point, feel free, mate. But I relate to slightly, not nowhere near on that level, but I certainly relate to when you feel good and instantly wanting to like get back on it and drink. It's very much how, what my life and everyone out there, I think, uh, not everyone, but everyone that sort of was similar to me um, lives like like lives like fucking smashed, annihilated at the weekend. Can't think of anything worse than drinking and doing drugs like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you don't. So you're definitely not an addict. And then fucking Thursday comes. Well, normally it'd be Wednesday sort of evening. I'll have a couple. Thursday I'm drunk. Friday I'm drunk. Yeah. But like it's like the slightest bit of normality coming back into your body, and you're like, mate. Do you know what? I'm going to get smashed. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? Forgot about all the weekend arguments. Mate. All the promises. It comes back again. You think, yeah. Just have a couple though, Friday. Yeah. Boys, when we finish work, have a couple. Mm. That'll be it. And then yeah. straight Fine. through. Have Monday off work and on it goes again. So did you relapse after that? Yeah, yeah. Every year. Every year. <laughs> Every year. <laughs> For eight years. <laughs> Did you go back to the same place in France? Yeah, no. well, I went back to different <laughs> yeah, areas yeah. in France, but, and the company kept employing me. God knows why. But yeah, every year I'd come home. But you'd still, so you didn't, you didn't associate the alcohol with the addiction. No. Yeah. So I thought heroin was the problem because it's illegal. I inject it. Yeah. It's habit forming. Yeah. And it's really bad for you. Yeah, but I'll be all right on alcohol. Alcohol's all everyone drinks, and yeah. it is a society norm, isn't it? Yeah. And that is the opinion yeah. of alcohol. Yeah. But I would fly back from France, 
get back to UK and then uh, mm. like land and go, right, okay, I'm going to treat myself. <laughs> Because yeah. cause I've done so well over the summer, no, I'm going to treat myself, right? And and because I'm only, because I sort myself out, I'm going to smoke it. Mm. And that's what I do. But you have this thing with heroin. You've got three or four days. They say, don't use four days in a row. I don't know what, where it come from. It's just uh, like some type of myth. So I go, yeah, I use the first day. That's it. Second day, I wake up, spent the whole night itching and scratching because I can feel it on me. My body's not had it for such a while. Mm. Second day I wake up, just today as well. Mm. Just, it was, it, to sort myself out. Cause it, yeah. yeah, just put myself right, and then that'll be it. And then the third day, same again. And then you've got that fourth day. I'd use the fourth day, and then I'd spend the whole of the winter using, yep, destroying my parents, poncing off of them, being a nuisance again around town. And then as soon as summer come, I'd piss off and do it all over again. It's mad, isn't it? You had, yes. to go, you had to go through withdrawals every time. Yeah. And d was it the same every time? Did it kind? Did your body get almost like, oh, this is this process now, so it gets easier, or it was just horrendous every time? No. So it got worse. Oh, really? And the reason it got worse is because my body got used to it, so mm. I used more. So when I got over there, you know, in the latter years, I'm used. I take stuff with me. It'd be plugged up me, all of that type of stuff. I'd use a load. Go, right, what I'll do is I'll use it over a period of days and like make tail it, tail it off so I don't feel too ill. Mm. And I'll get there and use everything in the first day or second day, and then I'll just be violently ill for the next two, three weeks. Horrific, isn't it? It's yeah. horrific, it really is horrific. It's destroyed, destroyed whole communities, hasn't it? And yeah. fucking all right, <laughs> let's get to the good bit. How did you manage to fucking crack that? Because I Tell me something now, because I'm a firm believer that it's not, you know, it's, it's, you know, although all di some addictions are harder, a hell of a lot harder to crack or to get off. Some of them are more like your body, you, you know, um, but I believe that it's all kind of rooted in the same thing, right? It's all rooted in your thinking, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, it's like the, like we, like we started this conversation with, like, like many of them start on this podcast. It's like, you know. It, it's something was missing something was missing and that came from childhood or w whatever you'd been through and it's that that needs to be looked at it's that that needs to be fixed because although um you know the drugs became the problem in the beginning they're the solution to your problem right yeah um so talk me through how you got clean and how, how long sober are you now i am i was 11 years on the 24th of september oh my brother 11 yeah. years miracle isn't it fucking how old are you then if you don't mind me asking uh, 47. 47, 11 years. Wow, that is a miracle, mate. Yeah. That is a miracle. If you think about that, you you spent half your life yeah. on heroin. Yeah. And then you, you're, go on, talk me through it. How, how did this happen? And what, what, well, tell me what, what the, f I, 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 I appreciate that we have many, many rock bottoms, but what yeah. was the last one? And how, what was that turning point for you? Yeah, there, there is many rock bottoms. And I guess, mm. you know, I guess you said it's rooted in your thinking. Mm. So for me, it's rooted in a belief system. So it's what I believe about yeah. myself, right? Which dictates my thinking. Yeah. Which dictates my actions. Yeah. Which dictates my results. Mm. Which, which gives me my identity. So mm. It's like a self-defeating cycle. Mm. So wait, wait. Just to start you on that again, it, it's what you believe in yourself. Yeah. It's so. It's, Everything it's, starts with a belief. What your belief is about yourself. Yeah. Who you are. What, yeah. what you deal with and what's yeah. happened and how you view the world. So if I said something to you, yeah, and it offended you, it's because you believe something. So then you think something mm. connected to that, and then the, the chain goes on. It's so interesting that you say that because my friends, particularly one group of friends that I've got, um, uh, Lee, Matt, and Mark. There's like four of us, and we're in this little golf group. And I used to constantly be getting the hump with them and different people when I was drinking and using. Uh, I honestly thought they didn't like me and they were being horrible and rude and spiteful. Um, but since I've been sober, the, all the piss taking that goes on, I love it. Yeah. And I believe that's because how I view myself yeah. is different. Well, you are. You're doing the work. I've seen it. Mm. You're putting it in. You're trying to change your mindset. So you're changing a belief within yourself. Right. You don't long now... 
believe as much as you did, oh, I need to go out every week mm. because that's Dan. Yeah. Dan is the bloke in the pub. He's the centre of attention. He's a right laugh. Yeah. The geezer. All yes. Of that. Yeah. You're starting not to believe that. Dan is a, a family man. Yeah. And he spends time with Shelley and the kids. Yes. Dan's yeah. building his business. In fact, yeah. Dan kind of enjoys being sober. Yes. And yes. you're changing your belief. Yeah. And therefore, it's going to change your identity. Yeah. So I believed I was worthless and useless, mm. okay? And what happened, it just got to a, a stage where I was using drugs mm. and they didn't work. They stopped working. Wow, what, the, 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 the heroin, yeah? It just, it didn't take the pain away. So it stopped the withdrawals, but it didn't take the pain away, that internal thing. Mm. So it was just there was no escapism. It no. was just it was it was it wasn't an escapism of the mind. It was yeah. like a physical withdrawal or escapism. That was it. Yeah. So the the withdrawal would stop, but I would still be in that pain. Yeah. I would still want to die. I would still walk them streets, worthless, useless, just thinking this is my life and this is it. And uh, my parents probably don't know this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna share it anyway. So I went over to France. My parents moved to France. They was over there. And I went over there. And I'd had enough. And uh, they had this, like, this log fire thing in their mm. room. And they'd gone up to bed. 30-something years old, back on their couch for another two weeks. I'll get myself clean type of thing. And I just I was poking this fire with the, the poker and getting it all stoked up. And I was just sitting there and... No, it's not working and I'm so depressed and I just thought I can't do this I cannot do this anymore mm. I had nothing I didn't have a girlfriend I didn't have kids so I had nothing I just remember thought okay so this is it this is my life and I took, remember I took that poker out of the fire and it was glowing I just remember pressing it into my forearm pressing in as a sign of pure self-hatred towards myself and I took every tablet I had took the lot just ingested the lot and then drank a bottle of gin I thought that's it that's it it's oh all no. over Fucking hell. and then I woke up the next morning and even that was like you, you can't do even do that right <sighs> Man. but so, and my mum and dad didn't see that but they knew the depression prior to that. Mm -hmm. And they'd done something. And they instigated enough to usher me into treatment for the first time. And by going to treatment, I didn't stay clean. But a message, a seed was planted. Hmm. It was the first time I experienced that other people were staying clean. Hmm. Powerful. So I see stuff there. So you saw, you saw a different life. Yeah. I thought, oh, wow, they're doing it. So I started going to the meetings, started talking like them, mm. et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't change my belief. Mm. You know, I'm still worthless. I'm still useless. And eventually, after a period of time, I couldn't deal with life, couldn't manage my emotions. So I used again. Mm. And uh, when I used, I remember, I went over to France and I'd been clean for about, three months mm. I went over there and I went because no one could see me I thought I'll have a beer they say the first one does the damage don't they mm. so in France you get something called a demi which is half a beer mm. so I had that I ended up getting paralytic and because I'd lived in France for so many years I knew how to work the doctor's system so I ended up with script to Subutex and a load of benzos right took all of them don't remember leaving France and flying back to Luton. Turned up in the dry house and I am all over the place. I got kicked out. Within two days, I'm homeless and I'm sitting outside Luton train station begging again. And I just thought, how has it come to this? Just one beer. One just beer. one beer. Yeah. And it's that moment I went, ah, oh, get it. You are the problem. <laughs> mad didn't it yeah I used for five years <sighs> and I knew I was a problem and for that five years I used every single day I used I used against my will and that's my rock bottom that five years yeah
It's so powerful what you're saying, mate. It's so powerful. There's so many messages in there, like like just, you know, just phew, even though your story is so different to mine, mm. there's d this is the thing with addiction that I even though your story is a million of miles away from mine, there's so much I relate to it. Yeah. There's so much that I relate to it, even though it not being heroin, it being cocaine, and even though you know, it not being five years or like the yep. first time I went so, but not being five years, it being like six months or whatever, yep. but it still was all right, one beer. Yep. And then it was carnage, mate. Yep. And I was sitting there, it was almost like, and tell me if you relate to this, it was almost like, now I know I'm fucked. And now I understand that I'm an addict. I want to consume as much as I can yep. until the next time I've got to stop this. Shit. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. When I watched you that first time round, in my head, I thought, he's going to drink again. Mm. And I knew. Because as your, the words you used, your behaviours and actions. Mm. And then you did, yeah. Can you remember that video I put up? Where I'm, I, I, I had one, I, I was doing a yeah. so nice video. I yeah. put a video up, I was like, do you know what? I've done however many months, three or four or five, or whatever, I can't remember what it was now. But I was like, oh, I'm back on the beers. I'm just going to have the beers. Yeah. And I filmed it and put it up like it was a celebration. Yeah. And how did you know that I was going to go back to it then? What did you see? So the town I live in now, I, I, we are amongst addicts all the time. There's massive recovery uh, mm. communi community there. So I see patterns and demographics and mm. just what you was doing and what you were saying or you was hanging around with the situations you was in. Mm. But I'm not going to send you a message saying... Dan, you're going to use again. You're going to say, "Who's this?" Yeah, you know because I mean? yeah, I guess, I guess because I hadn't. Well, I'll tell you why. Because I was, I, I that that time I was like, I'm not, I'm, I'm going sober. It was, it was just for Shelley. Really, yeah. it was like you know to end problems. It wasn't. I didn't believe I was an addict or, or think that I had a problem, yeah. and that's why I was still in amongst it. You know, like I'll still go to the pub, be with you, like, but I ain't drinking. But I was there, and that's why this time round I watched you and I thought it's different. Mm. exactly what you just said and i know you struggled with it yeah but you didn't think you was an addict yeah but now even though you don't like to call yourself that, yeah you know yeah i know the problem i know well the difference yes 100 yeah. percent. So. well the difference the difference is for me now and um the difference is for me now is what i thought an addict was then as well like my mature my my i had an immature bit of an immature view on what an addict was or a ste i had a stereotypical view of what an addict yeah. was you know uh, I thought an addict was a heroin addict or I thought an addict, an alcoholic was, you know, uh, it, it, drinking every day. Yeah. You know, I wasn't an addict in my mind. I'm not, I'm not an addict. But now my, now my um, view of addiction is if once you start drinking as well, you know, or using whatever, you can't stop like, you know, yeah. and, and like you said, when you picked up that beer and, and again, this is why I think it's kind of, kind of the journey of sobriety and it, you've got to be careful not saying this because you could, I don't want to encourage people to relapse at all, but I feel like there's so many similar journeys. It's like, you don't think you need to stop. You know I'm wrong or blah, blah, whatever. And then you stop, or you try and stop. And it's either like the, the action of trying to stop and not being able to stop yeah. or realizing you've got to stop and then kind of stopping and then going back and seeing the rapid annihilation, the rapid like destruction yeah. is kind of part of the process. We well, could say like, for, you know, it you can stop, mm. but can you stay stopped? Yeah, and that was the problem for me. Yeah, you know what I mean. I found it impossible to kind of stay stopped. Yeah, that was the problem. Yeah, because I can I can remember as well. It's like stuff was happening. Stuff was happening to me. I don't know if it had always happened to me uh, when I was drinking and using, but certainly when I went back to it, stuff was happening that was out of my control, mm. uh, which I never thought was happening before. Like for instance, saying to a all right, I won't drink tomorrow. All right, sorry about all of that. I won't drink tomorrow. Yep. And then being out and then finding myself drinking and then suddenly going, oh my God, I'm drinking. And going, oh, yeah. what, uh, you know what I mean? Where'd where, that come from? Where'd that come from? Yeah. And then whereas, or, and then, or, and then, or looking back at the week and going, oh mate, you, you, you got off your nut like four times this week. That's more or less every day, yeah, yeah. every other day on drugs. And then all of a sudden I was like, so yeah. So I know you said we like we use different different mm. ends of the spectrum or whatever, but we got two things in common, mm. and one is we both know that pain. Yeah. Yep. No matter how we used or what we used, and for anyone listening, how would I used? If you're there and you've been there, you know that pain. Yeah. And the other thing we got in common is our goal, mm. and that's to remain. Yeah. In recovery. Yeah. 
So it don't matter what you use, how you use, we got that. Yeah. Yeah, it's making a bit emotional, mate. It's quite powerful, you know. And it's like, I will, when I, I don't know if I've said this before, but when I walked up to the first meeting, I'd done it down in Guildford, and I walked up and I, I looked at the guys there, and I was kind of like, and I can remember this one guy had a big, like, porpoise nose. Yeah. And he said to me, what's wrong, mate? Do you not think you're meant to be here? And I instantly went, yeah, I, I, why? Because I look different to you. Yeah. And it, and he said to me, um, have you struggled to stop, to stop? And do you want to stay stopped? And, uh, you know, are you in pain? And and he said, well, you're meant to be here then. Yeah, I think you tr you try and dismiss yourself from the qualification if there is such I do thing. do that, I think. Yeah. I think, do you know, I think, I think sometimes I don't, I feel a bit guilty, maybe, I don't know. Not yeah. guilty or like that I haven't used or had enough destruction or da 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 to be here talking yeah. about it. But that's why I try and get people into learning. But yeah. You're, you're using was enough then. Yeah. It's what you did or you wouldn't be doing this. Mm. You know, I've watched your stuff and I've heard you. Yeah. And I know the pain. Mm. And mm. you hear people's stories and I can do it as me say, oh, I ain't been in prison. I ain't done that. Mm. Blah, blah, blah. But I'm at a stage now where I just know. Yeah. And it ain't about what I've done. It's about when I do it, what happens. Yeah. And that's enough. That is enough, man. That's enough. Yeah, I had, uh, yeah, yeah. Talk me through how you recovered then. So, uh, so that five years. Yeah, five years. Another treatment centre, another detox unit, more mm. drug services, etc. I ended up in, uh, ended up in a detox unit in Western Supermare. Mm -hmm. Remember, I went in there. Just uh, had me thirty sixth birthday in there, mm -hmm. and uh, I just thought, here, here we go again. Fucking work. Yeah, another five months of therapy and st sitting in groups and sharing me stuff and another withdrawal, all, all of that. And I left that that detox unit and got a taxi to the treatment centre and I just thought, I'm going to drink. I'm going to stop on the way, I'm going to have a drink, I'm going to have a drink, I'm going to have a drink. And I was really fighting with me head the old way. Shall I? Shan't I? And I ended up in this... Uh, treatment centre I made it to the treatment centre and I'm in there and I just thought you know what I'm going to give this a go right so I, in previously I'd done 12 step treatment centres hmm. and this wasn't this was like a self empowerment treatment centre but I'm going to give it a go hmm. and when it all kind of fails and falls down around my ears you know I can tell everyone I told you so and then my misery can be refunded. Yeah. Right? Because that's my history. That's how the pattern plays out. Yeah. But I made a decision. I'm going to give it a go. Because mm. I knew to return and the drug's not working, that might no life. Mm. So I had to try something. And I did. And I found it excruciatingly painful, mm. really difficult and quite shy, quite reserved not outgoing so sit in these groups and bear me soul yeah to deal with all these personalities it was quite difficult and challenging time mm. and then i came out of there and i started going to meetings okay and by going to meetings i created a community around me and it was being amongst like-minded people that were in recovery mm. that my life began to improve you know, it changed. So you think, so I always think it's the condition of the person you're with. So I spent 20 years sitting with addicts, nothing happened. Now I've spent the last 11 years sitting with addicts and something's happened. It's because the people I spend my time with now are in recovery. Right. Mm. And it just changed. I mean, how I recovered is I went through a 12-step program. Yeah. It's as simple as that. You know, I've done work on myself, dissected my life, looked at myself, replaced certain negative behaviour patterns and character defects with different spiritual principles, mm -hmm. you know, and made a decision, which mm. is very important to me, is that I weren't getting clean. Mm. I was getting my life back and more. Yeah. And that's important to me. So for very early on, it was like, I'm going to live Mm. I'm going to live and I'm going to embrace life I'm going to cling on to it and enjoy it you know what I mean so that's what I did wow and that's 11 years 11 years and you still work on it every day 
or how, do you, how many meetings are you are you still doing the meetings and I still go to meetings mm. um, mm. I still do everything I can yeah. for my recovery but um I still carry the message everywhere I go yeah I'm an advocate for addiction recovery mm. but I build my life as well so that addict I described mm. I ain't that person today so I've got a completely different life yeah I, f I can relate to that yeah. slowly it's like and i kind of say to people that reach out to me i've had a few people that, and now i look at i look at some of the questions that i'm asked from people and i kind of look at them i'm like Fuck, that's my thinking the what the, the quick you know oh, what am i going to do about me mates or going to the pub and da -da -da, i'll be like how old are you you know and they're like you know late late 30s early 40s and they've got families i'm like who gives a change a whole life change everything yeah. do whatever it takes but i look at that thinking and the and the things that they feel is the people feel it or and they're exactly the same things i felt were important i couldn't let go yeah it's so crazy well, i did I, I changed it drastically so i went i went and educated myself mm. I thought, okay i smashed on my shoulder up many years ago yeah i, done, so I shoplifted some of running away in trips <laughs> trips and yeah. smashed on my shoulder on a tree and managed to kind of secure me beers and run off no. so i thought right i'll educate myself mm. i'll go and do something different so i ain't got to do any manual physical work and uh when i got clean i was about a year clean mm. and then i'll put myself in college and i had done an access course <laughs> and then while, while i was doing the access course they ask you what universities do you want to apply for and what degree do you want to do? Mm -hmm. I didn't have a clue. I was just happy to be clean. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Just clinging on to the days one day at a time kind of thing. And uh, so I looked at it, and what happened is I ended up going to a university in Bristol, and I'd done a forensic science degree. Why have I had this before? I think we we had a guest on. Uh, I had another guest. I don't know if the episode's come out yet. Forensic degree. Is that like um like a crim criminal, like crime scene stuff? Yeah, it's part of it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So, so I can't oh, so is it like psycho like, like, like the psychology of, of no, criminals? No, no, so proper forensic science right across the board. So forensic psychology, crime scene investigation, DNA analysis. Why, the, why did lot. you pick that? I have no idea. <laughs> right, it come down to something like, right, pick something. And I think I was going to do environmental science because I like travelling. Yeah. Right, and I thought I'd do that. But then I really didn't want to do it. Yeah. So I thought, right, what can I do? And it came down to forensic science and biomedical science. I just thought, well, I know a little bit about crime. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll go there. Yeah, no. And, uh, yeah, and I, I found myself at uni and I was like a year clean and I'm doing this degree. And just as I've started, the girl that I've met turned mm. around and says, oh, I'm pregnant. Wow, it's like your whole life is changing. Yeah, and I'm like just newly clean and I'll just think, oh, no, this is a lot. Yeah. I'm how do I do this? How, know how that do feeling. I manage, manage this and navigate? Now I can't f as well. Yeah. 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 Especially that. Yeah, that, 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 that. I know that feeling like, all right, it's all well and good. Everything's great. But f now I really can't f up. Yeah. Wow. And uh, <laughs> yeah. And especially when my daughter was born. Because I remember my wife. She's my wife now. Wow. I got married, so I've been, she, we've been together nearly 11 years. We wow. met when we first got clean, we stayed together, and uh, we got married last year. Was she, was she an addict as well? She is, she wouldn't mind me saying, she's in recovery, she'll be 11 years next month. Wow, yeah. congratulations. So we've done it, work our own programs, yeah. do our own independent stuff, but united. Support each other, yeah. yeah, yeah. United in our goal. Brilliant. But she had kids before, and she told the midwives and that, that, I, my labours are quick. And they said, yeah, don't worry about all that. Go back home. You're going to be a few hours yet. Mm. She said, oh, I've got the pains. It's really going here. And uh, we was over in Asda across the road. And she said, it, it's, it's coming. coming. It's coming. I thought, oh, bloody hell, we need to get back to the house. So we got her back to the house. And, <laughs> uh, and literally, she's gone, it's now. It's now. So we got the ambulance on the way. She's got up from the living room. Set E, she's managed to get to the kitchen. And she goes, that's it. I can't can't go. She said, it, it's coming, it's coming. Oh, my God. And I'm just thinking, what do I do here? So I'm on the, the phone to the ambulance people saying, you better get here as soon as you can because I ain't got a clue. 
her friends were so she had her sponsor there at the time and a friend and they was there and I could just look on their face and I thought it's coming this ain't right oh this ain't right and uh, literally as the ambulance come through the as the paramedics come through the door this little baby kind of slid out onto the floor on the kitchen floor yeah born in her waters <gasps> yeah and that kind of popped and then she come out and I just remember thinking oh, thank god I'm in this position yeah yeah so to handle this to see it to be present as well and yeah well it was the little things Dan because before when I used to live in my flat I had dust sheets as curtains I'd sold everything in my house apart from a slow cooker for mm. some reason I had a uh, cat that left me all my windows were boarded up I had nothing mm. and then when they was there this time they needed pillows they needed clean towels yeah. I had a phone I had all this stuff wow they just could, put it in perspective yeah and I just thought thank god this happened while I was in recovery wow and they took her off and uh, yeah got had our little daughter we've been raising her for the last nine years and uh, wow she's a miracle mate just, I know it's not a little thing, but that thought of if I if I wasn't sober, that it's that stuff that keeps you. Fine. You know what I mean? Those moments that you're like, I really need to be like this. Nine, yeah. How was her name? Sophia. Sophia. <laughs> Born on the kitchen floor. Yeah, I love that. The birth certificate says the name, the address of where we was. But it's like you said. I knew. I thought I, I have got to be responsible now for the rest Stars. of my life for this little mm. bundle of joy. Yeah, That's man. That's my job. I just had this image of you running out of Asda with your pregnant wife. And, and I was just thinking, mate, you've run out of there with some stuff before, haven't you? But never a pregnant <laughs> wife. <laughs> never a pregnant wife. No, <laughs> usually blocks of cheese and bacon. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. That's Well, that fills me That fills me with joy, man. My, my kids, as you probably know from following my social media, are, um, you know, my, my, my motivation. Yeah. Yeah, and, definitely. Uh, and, um, yeah. So what advice would you give to people that, I mean, man, what advice would you give to people that are looking at it now or that are in it or feeling it or what's what, you know, I always like to ask people, what's the, like, you know, what nuggets would you give to people? What's the main bit of information you'd give to someone right now that was looking? Because I always, I love to, I, or I don't love to, but I always like to look at what my perspective was looking at sobriety because yeah. the, the thought of it always was it. Yeah. So what advice would you give to anyone looking at it now or that's in pain? I would say you need to be honest, yeah? Mm. You need to be really honest with yourself and identify a problem. Mm. And if you identify that problem, you need to be willing to make the changes you need to make mm. in order to change your thinking and your behaviours to live a new way of life. Mm. And no matter what happens, no matter what you come up against, don't use, right? Because you... When you use, there's no hope, yeah? When you're in recovery, there's always an ounce of hope somewhere, right? So no matter what happens, stick with it, because there's always someone that's been through it and stayed clean and mm. sober. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. So our second child, Jacob, he was also born <laughs> in the same house. Right? Oh, really? What, is that quick again? It was planned. Oh, right, okay. It was planned. So we said, we'll have him at home, so on their birth certificate, they got the same address, <laughs> right? So we called the midwife's round. Mm. She's going through the labour. They've turned up, and we're there in the living room, two midwives, me, my wife, and Sophia was in the cot in the other room asleep. And uh, when it's happening, it didn't look right. Mm. And I'm watching the midwife's face. Mm. And I could just see her face change. She looked at her friend and said, Breach! We've got a breach! Mm. Okay? So up until that point, we was told everything was all right. Mm. We shouldn't have to worry. Mm. Then we had this breach. What does that mean? That's sorry. So the baby had turned. Right. So instead of being head down, it's coming out feet first. Mm. Okay? And my wife was really pushing to get this child out. But because we was at home in the living room, I don't think the midwife had the apparatus they needed and the equipment they needed to do this job personally. And he was trapped and starved of oxygen for about 28 minutes. 
and I remember the midwife's arguing, saying we've got to get him out. And by that time we had had more midwives turn up, paramedics. They finally got his baby out. And I remember him saying, heartbeat, we've got a heartbeat. And in that moment I thought, oh, yes. It's a bit of hope. I thought, yeah, okay, good. So my wife was rushed off to the hospital. I followed up in an ambulance. And our little son, Jacob, so he was put in the ICU unit. And he had all these wires coming into him and pads and the little vest thing. Big screens and monitors. I was just thinking, how is it? How we come to this? This is bad, you know? But because we was part of a community, we had enough people, they just come up every single day. It was constant. How are you? How are you doing? We didn't know what to do. We just cried our way through it. He was the poorest baby on the ward, we got told, and they moved him to another room. And then uh, five days old, I had to hold that little infant in my arms whilst my wife clung on to me. And he tried to take a few breaths. He didn't even take a breath and he just died. Oh, my past God. I'm so sorry, man. That's all right. I'm trying not. I don't want to get upset, but that's. F I'm sorry about that. It's just that stuff. It really gets me. I know. The babies, mate. And I'm really sorry, man. I'm sorry that you lost right, I'm sorry, mate. I'm sorry you went through that, man. It's it okay. just breaks my heart, man. I said that the podcast would be a tricky bit for you. Yeah. I know your kids are everything. Yeah, man. It breaks my heart. I'm I so know. sorry, mate. I, I don't know how you managed to get through that. How did you stay sober through that? Sorry, mate. Fucking hell. Because, Dan, I had, I had hope because I was clean, right? I could make a choice. I could throw everything in and go back to what I knew, yeah? Or I could just grit, grin and bear it, put my head down and, and soldier on. And I looked at my daughter and thought, that's my responsibility. Oh, God, how old was she then? six years ago she was about three oh. she slept in the cot the whole way through everything which I'm so grateful for but what we did is we just pulled close to everyone in recovery yeah and we spent the next 18 months two years of our life crying mm. everywhere we went mm. just you know if we went to a meeting we shared about it we spoke about it to the point where people went oh here they go again yeah but I didn't care and we've done it, and we've done it. And what we've done is we, we grieved, and people say time is a great healer, but I don't believe that. I think it's what you do with your time which will determine the level of healing, mm. and it's what we've done with our time. We grieved, yeah. we stayed in community, we stayed in recovery, mm. we shared our experience, and then we helped others. So we set up some things to... Um, to remember him, Jacob, set up a little mem memorial service mm. that uh, we set up every year on the anniversary of his kind of life. Yeah. So we raised that. And uh, loads of fundraising. Mm. So I've done a massive fundraiser last year where we went to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Wow. So it took a bit of preparation to mm. set it all up. And we was raising all this money and... Uh, so we're over there in Tanzania, ready to go up. You know, <laughs> wow. two years it's taken. You know, with the hashtag was honouring Jacob, mm. trying to honour my son. I'm raising money for charities involved in infant loss. Mm. Yeah. Okay, the charities at the time were Cots for Tots and Sands, mm. and uh, we're there trying to climb this mountain. You know, it's uh, I, I, I kind of belittled it and underestimated it. Mm. When I got there, it was a kind of tricky thing to do. And I remember on summit night, um, I kind of gave up. Mm. I thought, I can't do this. If, I was just exhausted then. Mm. Everything in me mm. I'd expend is a massive story to it, but just I expended everything. I just couldn't do any more. Mm. Summit night, I gave up. And uh, one of the girls in the group that I was with, she turned around to me and she said, it needs to be you that scatters your son's ashes at the top of Kilimanjaro. 
and she shifted something in me. Yeah. And one of the guides, the porters that was with us, he said, Terry, he goes, look. And he turned me round and I could see the sun coming up over the horizon. And it was just to me, it was that spiritual moment. Mm. Godly thing, spiritual thing, the universe talking to me. It lit everything up. Mm. And he said, can you commit to another half an hour? I said, I can do half an hour. I'll do half an hour and then I'll go back down. That half hour turned into about eight hours, right? But what happens is I managed to get to the top. Okay, and when I, I timed it, so when I stood at the top, that particular day, it was the 24th of September last year, mm -hmm. and I turned 10 years clean that day. And I managed to scatter my son's ashes at the top yeah. of Kilimanjaro. I fucking love that, mate. That's yeah. powerful. And just that's what I did to stay clean through the death of my son. Things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Every anything, everything. It's like push on. His life was worth it. Yeah. Fuck. In five days ain't gonna be forgotten. I'll just do that. Oh, man, f no. Could have warned me about that, mate. F <laughs> oh man. Oh f no. I, you know what? The pain though, the the you know, the, like I feel like that's it's so powerful and you know it's just because I'm, I'm i'm full of love man so you know mm. i had love for you for your for your son then and it just comes out in tears to me man and yeah. and and i think it's so powerful and it's so important to share it because the um man, i couldn't you know when my father died I, I drank through it and i realized now that when i went sober i had to mourn it was weird you know i mean although i was mourning I was really mourning when he died and I was drinking and sniffing and escaping. It, my, I mean, my escalation of drug use and drink went up, but I suddenly, this time round, when I really went sober, I really felt felt for him and f thought about him a lot. And I feel like it's because, you know, you, yeah. you know, so sobriety is so hard when things like that happen in your life, isn't it? Because you've been, t you, everything, every bone in your body is telling you to escape that pain. And we know how to s escape the pain. Yeah. Our default setting is to smother it, to soothe it, to suffocate it with yeah. substances. Yeah. But that's a good indication of recovery. Yeah. Because when you know you can't do that, when you un actually understand that, then you know you're in recovery. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shit, I've got to feel this pain. Yeah, and I, and and that's what I, that's a massive part of my message that I that when I'm doing my videos and I say to people, and I really want I really want people to sit to hear. And it's like, it's what I learned. It's the biggest thing that I learned, to sit with your pain, to sit with it. And for me, the hard, it, over my dad dying, over everything was guilt and shame. Yeah. Shame for me was the big one, you know. The f stuff I'd f***ed up. Um, and, and sitting with that was like, everything was telling me, you know, don't think about that, don't feel that. It wasn't until I felt it and thought it and spoke about it that I suddenly, not, I mean, I'll always feel an ounce of it, but it won't consume me, do you know what I mean? That's it, becomes manageable. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so what I've noticed over the years, if there's a, someone dies and there's a bereavement, it taps in mm. and I connect it. Oh, there's that pain again. Yeah. But, yeah. It, you know, it doesn't overwhelm me. Mm. I just go, yeah, there it is. Yeah. This is familiar. I know how to navigate this. And Jacob, yeah. Yeah. So Jacob actually now has become a massive part of your recovery. He, he, Jacob is actually something that you can go, well, whatever happens in my life, I've got Jacob there that I've, that I've, you know, that has, you know, I don't know how to word it right, but, you know, you went through that with Jacob. Yeah. So you can take anything on. Yeah. Do you feel like that? It, it is, it's a, it's a marker of my recovery. I'm a, a marker of your recovery, yeah. yeah. I've done that. <sighs> so I'm quite well prepared for what's next. Yeah. However, I've not lost a parent. Yeah. I've not had a divorce. If them yeah. things were to happen, Mm. How would I deal with them? I don't know. Yeah. But I've got this marker yeah. which tells me you that, don't that, need to give up. Yeah, and you have strength. Yeah, yeah. There's inner strength in there. You're stronger than you think. Dig deep, push through. Man, oh, thank you so much for sharing. John, anything, mate? I mean Yeah, I mean, that was obviously just you know, very emotional and you're you're really, really insightful and you've obviously like I, I don't know how to say it, but you're just you you're so like wise from what you've learned and you know how you talk about all your recovery and your addiction and everything, and yeah. So, so thank you so much for sharing. That was a really sort of one of the most powerful, you know, uh, like guest yeah. episodes we've had in here. So thank you for that. Cheers, John. Thanks, Mike. Man, um, yeah. I mean, I just know it's a beautiful podcast. You know, I just hope. I, I just know that uh, you know there's probably people out there crying now. 
<laughs> but I know that there's people out there that are gonna. Well, I don't know how to put this. There's people out there that just can't see anything apart from drinking and using drugs to get through this stuff. Yeah. So to hear stuff like that, I mean, you know, you look at. Uh, I mean, you must have seen that. Uh, what's his name? Ashley Ashley Kane, and um, is it Ashley Kane? Ashley Kane. He lost his daughter, I believe, to. Uh, and he does all the he does all the swimming and rowing and bike. Do you see his stuff online? Have oh, you ever no. seen? But he's very similar. I mean, yeah. he 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 lost he, he lost his daughter. I think uh, uh, Exalia. I think I don't want him, but to cancer. I think something like that. And um, I think it was cancer actually. But um, and he is motivated, so motivated yeah. um, by her, by that, yeah. by that. And it's like a power to him. And uh, when he talks about it, I know it helps people out there that are going going through that stuff. So thank you so much, man. No worries. Thank you. Anything you want to finish on? Anything that you want to say? Or can people find you online? Or do you, yeah. do you offer any sort of like online stuff? Yeah, well, I'm a, so I am a recovery coach. I love that. That's what I do as well. I just started up, set up my business. Mm -hmm. so Divine Interventions Recovery Coaching. You got a perfect name for it, man. Well, there you go. It was it's, always it's meant destiny, to be. Destiny, aren't it? You just needed twenty years of <laughs> taking everyone on the about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, I'm on Instagram. Um, so it's Terry underscore Divine. You can yeah. find me on LinkedIn, Terry Divine as well. But um, I'm also a trustee for a charity called Towards Tomorrow Together, which mm. helps people with infant loss mm. in them situations. It was National Infant Loss Awareness Day yesterday. Oh wow! So I know this is a bit of a touchy topic yeah I, fa I, fa I found it quite difficult even even just talking about Ashley's bit there I yeah. was like oh it's like it's and plus my emotions because my I've got babies now and it gets people it really does yeah so if there's anyone out there and they've got experience in this area mm -hmm. or they're going through it you can reach out I've connected to a few charities so I can direct you into places mm. should you need the help because it's the worst thing yeah but it's survivable well, thank you so much. I'll make sure that I put them things in the. Just tell me about them again. So, you, you, what's what? What are they, What's the charity called? So, the charity I'm a trustee with is called Towards Tomorrow Together. Towards Tomorrow Together. So they can a, search for that. Yep. Yeah, so it's a local charity in Somerset. Mm -hmm. However, you've got Sands, which is a support group. Um, yeah. And that's a nationwide. Mm. So you, that people can search that one if they're from different areas over the UK. Yeah. Terry, mate, well, listen, I, I, you are exactly what I talk about, mate. We, we, somebody that, you know, that ha now has the ability to help people, to share and to, to guide people in the right way through your own, through turning your own life around. So congratulations on your sobriety and thank you for joining me and we'll keep, we'll keep talking on Instagram, yeah. man. Cheers, Dan. Thanks for the invite. That's Loved it. Right. And uh, yeah. Woo! Okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Terry. I really appreciate it. John, thank you very much. Thank you for having me once again. Love you, man. And uh, for everyone out there, thank you again. If you uh, if you if you tuned in through that, or you're listening at home, whatever you're doing, like I always say, this podcast is just sort of organically moving in in directions. But look at that; that is a prime example of me making my way up here today to sit down and have a, have, have just a little chat with Terry, and to just feel like I've like we have created something in this room over the last hour that could potentially just set thousands of people on a different route or get them thinking and give them hope and that's the main thing i don't i'm going to start crying again so i'm going to go but um big love to everyone out there sharing's caring so please do share the podcast leave us a comment and um yeah look terry up on instagram thank you very much bye Hello! We are going to take the Menace to Sobriety to the live stage and we need a live studio audience to interact with us, to come along, listen, laugh and learn everything about sobriety, mental health, well-being and just come along for a night out with like-minded people. We are going to be going live on the 30th of August, 27th of September, 25th of October and the 29th of November. That's one a month. Get your tickets now. Come down, meet the team and have some fun. Menace to Sobriety live, coming soon. Oh, yes. And don't forget, if you want to come and see me live and meet me, I'm going on tour. The Daniel O'Reilly Out of Character Full UK Tour kicks off in January 2024 and tickets are on sale right now. I'm going to try and get out and meet as many of you as possible. And of course, I'm going to be bringing the laughs all over the UK. There's 23 dates right now and I'm adding more all the time. Hit the link in the bio and get your tickets now and come have some fun. If you're going through a tough time at the moment, please don't suffer in silence. Feel free to pick up the phone 
and contact any of these helplines. I personally, myself, at one of my darkest points, contacted the Samaritans and it completely changed my outlook and got me out of a really deep, dark place. A problem shared really is a problem halved. So if you don't feel confident talking to those around you, check out any of these organizations and give them a call. This is my Facebook group. Just simply search on Facebook, Men and Their Emotions. It's for men only, uh, but once you're in there, you can talk anonymously about your problems and help others and just feel a little bit of community. So come join the conversation, Men and Their Emotions, on Facebook. Thanks for watching. Menace of sobriety. Just a menace. Just, just a menace. Just a menace. Menace of sobriety.